Now you might have seen this in a lot of videos in the background. Uh, I've been sort of tripping over it for a while. It's actually the base for a milling, uh, sort of a hobby mini mill. Yeah, like I said, the base for a mini mill. So you've got, uh, was it, X and Y direction, you know, uh, cross slide in both directions. And the idea being, and I'll put a picture up in a minute, um, I bought a lathe and mill combo from Hare and Forbes. And a lot of people suggested don't buy it. It's not not worth it. You want to have a dedicated mill, you want to have a dedicated lathe. And I was thinking, nah, it's fine. I, you know, I only do a small bit of machining, etc. But yes, everyone's correct. It basically the the mill function on the lathe gets in the way of, of your lathe operations. It's, it takes up too much space and is quite annoying. And also it means it's very difficult to mill something on a lathe because you're limited to the fixtures and fittings you can have on the lathe bed because there's no sort of like T-slots where you can clamp your parts down. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I, th I was thinking, well, I'll just take the the mill section off the lathe and at least I can use a lathe and I've got a nice uh, envelope to work in so to speak and then I saw this advertised on um, uh, on eBay they had this on sale and it was only going for a hundred bucks or something and when I looked at it it looked like an exact copy of what the optimum lathe uh, and milling company was using because basically all the mills and those hobby lathes and hobby mills they're all like clones of each other. So generally the parts can be interchangeable. So the idea being is, so I bought this, the idea I then, oh, pretty heavy old thing, is I'm gonna bolt the mini mill component, the, the, the vertical slide, I suppose you call it, to the back here. It's not a machine surface, so that means they're going to have to possibly either shim it or whatever. You can, you can buy a special epoxy resin that once you've got the position exactly right, you inject a epoxy resin in the gap and it goes off rock hard. They use it in proper machine rooms for this very purpose that you, once you've got your uh, faces correctly aligned, uh, they use this in between. It's better than shim material because shim material apparently flexes and, and can move around. And more importantly, you you get a, a much better point contact between the two faces. Because generally when you bolt two things together, you're probably only picking up on a couple of points, like maybe three points or more. Um, so it also means you can apply a lot more um, clamping force uh, between the two faces. So anyway, this is going to be an experiment. Um, so yeah, I bolt this on. Now, the whole point of the video is uh, <laughs> I also need to put it somewhere in the workshop and I'll need to make a stand, etc., to put it on. And I think what I'll do is similar to what I've done here with my other equipment. Yeah, so I'll do what I did here with some of this other equipment is instead of just making a freestanding uh, stand just buy a cheap uh, tool chest I suppose you call them um, I mean it's not particularly heavy and I'm not going for super rigidity so I'll do what I do here and just put on a thick piece of ply to give a bit of thickness there uh, and then stick the mill on it so I bought this Stanley um, tool chest one major modification I want to do to the stand stroke uh, tool chest, whatever, uh, is to put on some sturdy feet. I don't want it sitting on the casters. Casters are good just to move it around a workshop. Um, but yeah, I'll make some four feet or four posts with an adjustable bolt in the bottom. And we'll weld those to the base of the unit. And then uh, once we've got it wheeled in position, we can jack it off the floor and then it's sitting directly on the steel uh, feet. So I'll just cut some tube up, we'll um, clean up the ends, get rid of the gal, and weld in some nuts and make some feet. So I'm going to weld in uh, some nuts in the end of these tubes 
to, to act as the uh, jacking points and just to help uh, keep them straight when I weld them up using a very long threaded rod that way it sort of keeps it roughly in alignment with the tube and then we just tack weld in the end everything's galvanized uh, which doesn't weld well <laughs> um, so we're going to grind back the grind off as much as we can of the galvanized finish um, and then we can tack weld that in position So I've just tack welded that in position. Now I can weld it up vertically in the vise. Uh, and the only trick is when welding nuts like this, they're quite thin and they'll they can melt and distort the thread. So it's good to keep the um, a threaded bar in there while you weld, and just take your time going away the way around there without trying to melt the nut too much. Well, it's not very pretty, but um, you get the idea. Just take your time when you're welding so it doesn't completely melt the thread. So that's still, the thread still works, so it hasn't completely uh, distorted too much. We'll give it a, a grind, make it look pretty, take the, the uh, pigeon shit welding off like there. Um, and give it a quick spray paint and we should be good to go so i just need to make four of those as i didn't have any bolts with the thread going all the way right down most have a, a smooth shank on them i've just welded up um, the nuts onto the end of some threaded rod and then and they can just screw into the ends And that will be the, the adjustment. So I'm just going to clean up the, the welds on the end. I may even stick them in the lathe to get them a nice flat surface. So there are the four posts all ready to go. Now we've just got to weld them into the base of the stand. So the idea is we just um, put weld these to a plate and then weld the plate to the base of this um, uh, stand or trolley or whatever. And the only thing I'm concerned about is because it's quite a short, I suppose short wheelbase, is the balancing point is you know, a long way in, or relatively long way in. Um, so I think what we might do is actually swap these over. So these go on the outside and move these in and in a little bit, which is fine. Uh, but the bit of a headache is this side, because likewise, you know, if I was to put that there, the the swivel will get in the way and it'll have to be quite a quite a long way in I think and again it's encouraging tipping point so I'll probably do the same on this side and have the wheel or this wheel quite a way in because you can see how far it needs to be out I think that's better that we have the posts right on the corners for the extra strength and rigidity because you know all the weight will be going straight as close as we can on this corner and that's the, the most strength whereas obviously the further away from the edges the more flex you can get yeah so we'll we'll uh, make up a, a plate move these over i'll bolt these to the plate and then weld the plate in situ so what i've decided to do is just move this over one bolt uh, distance over so i can reuse these two existing rivnut fittings 
and that gives us plenty of space to then put in a plate here. Um, so all I've done is just creating two more holes to put the rib nut in and just repeat for the other other three wheels. So I've welded the post onto a plate and the plate fits in there. Obviously I've ground back as much as the paint as a dare and also ground flat these nut rivets so that it sits, sits down flat on there and then we'll weld it. Now given this is covered in paint it's going to stink, it will give off fumes. I'm going to do it outside. The issue is um, MIG outside is not great. If there's any wind, uh, your gas shield gets blown away. So I'm doing it close to the garage, but outside with my new portable welder. <laughs> um, the trick will be, this is paper thin steel on uh, five mil. So trying to weld this without disintegrating this too much, it's going to be a bit fiddly, um, but we'll give it a go. So I've got four to do. So as I thought, it is very tricky to weld this. You can see here, it's, it's sort of actually burnt through so thin. Um, but at least the weld <laughs> wrapped around. The other, the other areas, it's, it's really tricky. It's, you sort of balance in between the thinness of this side and the thickness of this. So you sort of tend to weld the plate and just touch the thin sheet. This is where TIG, I think, would come in as a better a better type of welding for this sort of application. So it's all welded up now. Um, as per Robin video, I'll put in the description link. Uh, he also found that these, even though these posts are quite solid, you get a bit of flex. So he uh, welded in a couple of extra ties, I suppose. So I've just got some angle iron and just welded it up like that. It looks a bit Heath Robinson, but seems to do the job. And obviously it's quite a tight squeeze, especially with the these ones. I had to make the cross ties really short so it didn't fail on the caster. Anyway, and also the yellow paint, that's all I had in stock and it's not a close, it's not exactly the same yellow, but um, that'll do, I think. So yeah, I think uh, we'll flip it up and um, put the lid on. Okay, because this is made out of really thin sheet, it's uh, quite flexible. You know, you get a lot of bounce. So because we're putting a heavy weight on there, you don't, I mean, it will support it, but we want a bit of rigidity. So um, we just got some scrap thick plywood. Um, it's just left over. And of course, being scrap, it never is exactly the right size. So I've just cut up a bit of scrap again, and that just wedges in there. And because this is probably going to have coolant or you know oil or whatever um, I'll make a little drip tray again out a bit of old scrap leftover sheet um, I didn't have enough width or length so I just made up a little bit on the end and even just for the fun of it um, bent or crimps the edge so it lies relatively flat um, then when I pop riveted it all those little rivets will stick out so I've actually just drilled some holes to allow that to sit flat on the top there. That's like that. And I might make a 
just make a small cut here eventually um, so that it allows it to at least drain any fluid out the front or whatever I'll, but I'll think about that later the main thing is you don't want coolant running down the back and onto the shop workshop floor so we'll just line it up so it's sort of nice and central and just got to make sure the rear post will fit on the back uh, we're going to machine this up from four holes so you can see these there's four bolts basically screw on so i'm going to put this back on the bench over there we'll mark out four holes drill it um, and there's a bit of a bit of slop in this to allow a little bit of movement so that's it that's the next step anyway at least proportionally it looks uh, decent obviously the table will be going you got to allow when you when I park this up I've got to allow some space for the table to to go sideways um, and I've got a, re a replacement handle when I got this delivered uh, there's a handle here and this is broken um, but I might leave it off because that way I'll get a bit more space and just have one end to, to wind with and off to the front is fine so that's that's good obviously it won't wobble once we put the jack for jacking um, bolts into the ground it will stabilize it at the moment it's just rocking on the casters at least i can move it around a workshop relatively easily I just marked out um two lines for where this adapter is going just wide enough and uh, we'll just get rid of the paint by gently scraping it off so we get a metal to metal surface so i just put a couple of rulers in here just so that um, the base of this doesn't touch the bottom so this is fully bolted to the top of the cabinet and this is just slightly high or proud and doesn't have to be accurate so i think that's about where we want to be and so now i just got to sort of mark the holes and as it's not a, a super tolerant precision fit i'll just get a drill that's slightly this the same size as this and drill it and we'll get four marking points and we use them as the centers so i've got a 13 mil size drill which just fits inside the uh, hole and i can just about touch off the surface so i'm not going to drill a hole with this i'm just using it as to like to make a center point for the center of the holes Okay, so we've got a centre mark for the top two holes, so we'll drill and tap those and then we can take these clamps off and do the bottom two. So these bolts are um, M12, um, in fact M12 by uh, 1.75 so you can always double check you've got the right tap, you can line it up and they'll always match up perfectly okay now with the tapping drill the 10.2 oh, one other thing you don't need lubricant on cast iron uh, apparently cast iron is self lubricating so no point you can put it on if you want but it's fine you can tell it's cast iron because there's no ribbon of steel coming off it's just a fine powder classic cast iron and that's why it's sort of self lubricating when you're when you're drilling but i will put some uh cutting compound on this threading um what do you call it um cutting paste this is what i use
seems to work quite well and just to help it we'll just put a small um, chamfer on the entrance to the to the hole again doing this by freehand is quite tricky if we had this in a drill press you can use a drill press to start the tap but it's such a big thing for my workshop I have to do it all by freehand so we just have to wing it try and get it square on just by eye and hope once it gets too tight, you need to stop because it's just chocked, choked itself with all the the uh, thread that it's cutting. So just back it out, give it a clean and repeat. Another important thing to know about um, taps for cutting threads is you can get three versions. Uh, one is like a starting tap and this will be good if you're just going to go put a hole all the way through something um, it's better because it's got a less um, more of a taper at the front you can see here compared to this one where it's got a lot of thread cutting thread at the very tip so this these ones are very good for starting and you can basically put that all the way through and cut a thread um, but if you've got a dead end situation where the, the thread is going to go to a bottom you need to make sure that uh, you finish off those last few threads as much as you can and then you've got the final one which I think is called a plug tap plug meaning plug bottom and that has the thread almost going through to the very end so in our case we need to make sure we run this as much as we can to the bottom till it bottoms out and we get a better um, engagement all the way down so we've machined up the four threads. Now we just um, assemble this and get it roughly level. Okay now we'll mount this on the on the stand. As with most people when you're doing projects you lie awake at night thinking of stuff and you suddenly realize you've done something wrong <laughs> and I've had one of those moments. Just to recap this column well, this milling machine was originally for the lathe over there. So that lathe um, came with this mill adapter. And the idea is, is that the milling column would bolt down here at the back of the lathe. And you can use the center line of the mill, um, center line of the lathe to mill possibly slots or features into, a, into your bar. We could even do some basic milling in the lathe. And it's such a unique or niche area uh, for me. I'm better off just having a standard mill. This is why we're doing this project. When you buy this mill for the lathe, the Optiplex lathe and probably other lathes, it comes with an adapter, which is this chunk of metal here, um, to allow you, I think, to offset where the center of the milling head will come down over the lathe. But the problem is, for this feature, it's pushing the mill head too far back. And in fact, even at the, you know, this is completely wound in, as far as it will go that way, the milling head will be just about there. Um, so this needs to come off and the manual states that it actually bolts to this face here to bring it in and then you get the full scope of your uh, carriage back and forth otherwise i'll be always milling right up against the, the the end of the travel so it's pointless so sadly all that milling and tapping and messing around was a waste of time i've got to remove this and instead put four extra holes in here now Hopefully they're not going to foul on the existing holes, otherwise we're stuffed and we're going to have to make a, 
an intermediate bracket. But anyway, take this off, recut these threaded holes into the base, and then start again. So that was a waste of time. Measuring, trying to work out the where these holes are going to be drilled. You need obviously need the dimensions so it fits. Um, as a trick, it's very difficult, obviously, to try and eyeball or guesstimate, even using you know calipers, especially on threaded holes, where exactly you know the centres are. So one trick is to actually put the bolts uh, back in, and you know their diameter is um, 12 mil. Um, and then use the the actual shafts of the bolt as a uh, guide for measuring your distances. So in this case, if we measure across that, um, that's around about 45. And then minus the, obviously the radius, because you want the centers of these drill points. So you just minus, um, these are 12 mil, so minus 12 of 45 is 33. And likewise, we do the same across here. I think that was 70, 75. Minus 12 again gives us a, a center line distance of 65. Um, and luckily for me, um, the manual actually has these dimensions already in them. It's very rare to have that. So this guesstimation method works out exactly with their drawings. So it's 33 across here and 75 across there. And the only other dimension we need is the distance from here to here. Now this is a rough casting. So all I've got to do is use, a, again, using the same method, is we'll just measure the distance to the shaft and that's uh, 20 mil plus uh, half the diameter, that's six. So it's 26 mil from there to the top. So we've got that measured out and then it's just gonna be in the center. So that's fine. We don't, we're not too critical about this. As long as that dimension and that dimension is correct, we should be good. Just use an old Sharpie to blow up the face so we can do our measurements. Or another way to transfer the uh, dimensions is to just sketch it out on a um, piece of paper to one-to-one -one size and then just transfer the center marks directly onto whatever you're doing. It's particularly handy if you've got a very complicated shape that you want to sort of cut out or do anything, but in this case it's pretty straightforward. And then we can just use, the, the t use it as a template and then with the center punch repeat and go straight through the paper. So I've cut the, the new four holes. It's looking a bit like a piece of Swiss cheese now, but I don't think it's gonna affect the integrity of this uh, casting. Uh, there's quite a th thick piece of steel behind here. So now I've got to see if my drilling was nice and straight and all the bolt holes go through. So the video has been going for a while now, so we'll uh, make this a two-parter. In the next video, we'll go through how I align the column to make sure that the uh, milling head is perpendicular to the bed.